Wilson, uh, the Chief of the Child and Adolescent Protection Center here at Children's National, and I'd like to welcome our um, our guests who are joining virtually for this Regional oh. Academy on Family Violence Lecture Series. We are so honored to have Dr. Jackie Campbell as our presenter today. Um, Dr. Campbell is a professor uh, at Johns Hopkins School of Nursing and a national leader in research advocacy and policy development in the field of violence against women and the health outcomes associated with it. She is an academician with uh, numerous federally funded research uh, initiatives through the NIH, Department of Defense, at CDC, and others. Um, and her work has really paved the way for a growing body of interdisciplinary knowledge about the experience of violence and physical and mental health outcomes, uh, risk assessment for lethal and non-lethal domestic violence. Um, she is um, a, a member of the American Academy of Nursing and the National Academy of Medicine. Um, so we are in the presence of greatness uh, for sure. Um, and uh -huh. uh, I, I just want to um, express my sincere appreciation for her willingness to join us in this format. Um, even though we are local, we're, we're still in this virtual space in hopes that we can reach a larger audience. Um, and so with that, I'm not going to belabor anything and give as much time to Dr. Campbell as I possibly can as she presents to us on intimate partner violence related maternal mortality. Well, I am absolutely delighted to be with you. I'm a big fan of the Children's Medical Center for, for many reasons. Um, and um, I am, uh, oh no, I've got, there it is. Um, and I hope everybody can see the slides. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, hopefully I'll get finished in time to do a little bit of questions at the end. If not, we'll go through the chat and I'll do some response by email later. Um, and uh, one of the things I always like to start out with is uh, land acknowledgement. Um, these are uh, the lands uh, in Maryland. Um, and I know you folks sit on DC, I could do it there, uh, but I, I think the important piece of this is the idea of the missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, their website is down there below. Um, and uh, I think it's really important, highly relevant to what we're talking about. Uh, three of the women in that report were pregnant when they were murdered. And one was murdered um, by a stranger, one by law enforcement, and one unknown. unknown. Um, murder in general in this country, uh, when women are murdered, it's most often by an intimate partner. The other thing I always like to do is uh, mention uh, Judy Atkinson's book, Trauma Trails, um, Recreating Song Lines. And the reason I like it, first of all, it's cheap now. It's only $1.99 on Amazon because it's old. Um, and it's also a very important read in terms of understanding the trauma trails, both for indigenous peoples, but also for those um, in our own communities who are experiencing uh, the traumas of racism and uh, the traumas of uh, family violence, either child abuse or witnessing domestic violence, and how that goes through our extended families and our communities. The other reason I like that book is uh, Judy is a therapist. So she talks about um, the kinds of things we can do to heal, as well as the kind of traumas that we experience. Briefly want to int introduce my own family. Uh, my grandchildren, four grandchildren, aren't they cute? Um, and first of all, and the other thing is to point out that that um, young lady in the canoe uh, up there, my daughter, Christy, 
uh, is a pediatric nurse practitioner of which I was, I am very proud. And her first uh, pain job was at uh, Children's. So uh, she used to commute down from Baltimore. Uh, she loved that job. And that's one of the reasons that um, I'm so proud to be able to work with you today. Um, the other thing I always wanna say is, uh, you can see her husband, Nick, there with their two daughters. And one of the things I always like to say is he had to pass all kinds of domestic violence tests before he was allowed to join the family. Uh, my son, Brad, over on the other side with his gorgeous, brilliant wife, Nadia, his complaint when he was growing up uh, was not that I would interrogate his dates, although I probably should have, um, but also that he was not only not allowed to be violent toward a woman himself, but he also was responsible for his friends never being violent toward a woman. And now that he's in the corporate world, he's responsible for uh, his uh, company writing a hefty check every year uh, to the local domestic violence uh, organization and also for having really good HR policies around domestic violence. And that's one thing for children's, um, you know, you kind of go have to go back um, every couple of years and update those HR policies. It's so important that our own workforce is um, knows where they can get assistance if they're experiencing violence in their um, families from their partners. Um, and the other thing I always like to say about uh, Brad and, and Nadia is they have these uh, two now adolescent uh, children, but over there in the baseball caps when they were young, uh, one of the things Brad called me one day and he said, so mom, uh, we have the big principles, Nadia and I are raising these children to be nonviolent. That's one of the our primary objectives um, in uh, helping them grow up. But we have a problem. At this point, uh, Nathan is bigger and stronger than Layla. And she's not only getting into all his stuff, and this is when she was about two and a half and he was um, four and a half, but she's also turned into a champion biter. So in domestic violence parlance, Layla was the primary aggressor. And so I talked to Brad, uh, we tried some things, we brainstormed about some things he might want to try. There's not any quick fix for this kind of thing, um, but different strategies they tried over time and gradually uh, she stopped doing that. Um, and this was great. However, it made me think about who is helping the young families in our community, your patients, who is helping those parents raise their children to be nonviolent, especially if those young parents witnessed domestic violence in their own homes? How would they know how to raise them? So that's one of the things that we need to think about from a community basis, from uh, as you interact with young families who are your um, who are the parents of your patients, um, those kinds of things our uh, communities really need some help with, because we continue to have way too much domestic violence and maternal mortality. So, as I'm sure you have heard. Um, in the United States, we have uh, far higher rates of maternal mortality than do any of the countries we like to compare ourselves to. Um, and unfortunately, this has been increasing, these rates of maternal mortality. Um, 
just since 2018, um, we have seen a uh, substantial increase. And unfortunately, the increase is the greatest and the rates are the highest for Black women and almost as high for Native American women. And uh, they are uh, substantially lower for white, Asian, um, and Hispanic women. Uh, so this is you know, a clear uh, call to us that we need to um, look at this, uh, these disproportionate um, inequities in maternal mortality. And here we have, as you can see, the, the same thing uh, shown slightly differently with bar graphs instead, um, where uh, the non-Hispanic Black women um, have uh, far higher rates than other uh, race ethnicities. On this chart, unfortunately, and you know, when you upload different graphics, I'm like, so where are Native American women here? Uh, because they are, they should be right there next to um, uh, non-Hispanic Black in terms of almost as much increase, and it has continued to increase 2018 through 2021. These, this is not to say that the rates of maternal mortality for white women and Hispanic women is not too high, because it is but uh, that uh, inequity is clear in this kind of graphic. So what, why is this? What is some of the uh, explanations for this inequity? And um, for indigenous women, uh, the trauma trails are very clear. There's historical trauma, um, and also the structural and individual experiences of racism, the structures that have and still do deny access to wealth and to health. Uh, we also find that indigenous women have um, higher rates of ACEs and also higher rates of intimate partner violence or gender-based violence. For black women, it's a similar kind of uh, historical trauma uh, Sotero, if you're ever interested, uh, has a really nice model. She's a social worker since 2006 of historical trauma uh, applied to our cities um, currently and our inner city populations. Um, Black women also have structural and individual experiences of racism um, and structures that have and still do deny access to wealth and to health. Um, and uh, Black women also have uh, higher rates of ACEs, adverse childhood events, um, and intimate partner violence. One of the things we know is that witnessing domestic violence or being abused as a child are the biggest risk factors for someone growing up to use violence against their own partners uh, when they have romantic relationships. And access to quality health care varies by wealth. We all know that. Um, even uh, with what we're trying to do now, it continues to vary um, by wealth. And when a person, most often a woman, is in a relationship where her partner uses violence against her. Um, this notion of extricating yourself from that relationship or leaving that relationship is far less possible if, you're, if you are poor. Um, one of the things uh, that I... Uh, know from working with a lot of abused women is that um, getting a divorce is really expensive in this country. And that um, if you're leaving a partner and there's a custody battle, trying to get a lawyer to represent you on that custody battle. And if there's been prior abuse, there's almost always custody battles. 
Um, and that is is really a, a, a for poor women, a very difficult piece. Um, you in uh, DC, actually, there is a wonderful organization that provides uh, pro bono lawyers to women who need them. Um, and it's oftentimes abused women. Um, and, and it is one of the wonderful advantages for those of you that live in DC, that that's a possibility. And then oftentimes women, in order to uh, address uh, violence in a relationship, they really need that legal representation. So um, for both Black women and Indigenous women and other women who are being abused, and for me, I am also concerned about the fathers of these babies. Um, one of the things um, that uh, we in the domestic violence world sometimes um, don't think about as hard as we should, that these fathers um, who, yes, are using violence against their partners, but um, they also are more likely to uh, be killed at the hands of police. Um, they are more likely to be incarcerated um, by our criminal justice system. And if we think about uh, the uh, wife uh, or partner of this man, even though he may be using violence against her, even if she's not sure that this relationship should uh, continue, that she's trying to figure all of that out, she doesn't want him to go to jail um, because that's, uh, you know, uh, means that her baby is going to have fewer resources um, for him or her that uh, she, no matter what's going to happen in the relationship, she wants her baby to have a father, to have an involved father, um, to, to know a father's love and caring. And that's important to that baby's uh, growth and development. So this whole issue of intimate partner violence is very complex. Uh, one of the books that I, you know, I have this reading list for you. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, the Beth Ritchie's uh, book is very instructive in terms of how Black women, um, and it's also true for Indigenous women and many times for immigrant women, are more likely to lose custody of their children. Um, be charged with crimes. They're more often arrested for domestic violence when the police come to a home um, and there's a, a black couple involved. Black women, it's much more likely to be a dual arrest, uh, that they arrest both people if the woman is black. Um, they're more often arrested and prosecuted for substance abuse. So those are some of the things that uh, we oftentimes um, don't fully take into account. Um, and so um, Black, Indigenous, and immigrant women are deeply concerned about calling the police if their partner is hitting them because of this unequal justice against their partner uh, they're worried about what might happen to their partner and or to them. Um, and uh, will they worry, will their neighbors hate them if they bring police into their neighborhood? Will his family be angry at her? This, this is their extended family. This is an extended um, family support for children. Um, Will they be, uh, you know, if police are brought into this uh, situation, uh, is this just going to put heap more scorn and difficulty onto her? And um, the other thing we always have to remember is that Black and Indigenous and immigrant and adolescent 
moms, moms to be, um, that they are deeply concerned. If they disclose abuse to us in the healthcare system, they'll get reported to CPS. And again, that they will be more likely to lose custody of their children to CPS. That the, the, um, there is unfortunately a um, difficult history with CPS. Uh, we want and we need CPS when there's child abuse, um, but there's also that fear um, of many women about disclosing domestic violence to healthcare um, systems. So one of the other realities in the maternal mortality uh, uh, realm is that deaths during pregnancy or in the postpartum, and that's the whole year after the end of the pregnancy, um, the, uh, that are unrelated to the pregnancy are called pregnancy associated deaths. And they're oftentimes not counted in the official maternal mortality statistics. Uh, the data that I was just showing you about maternal mor mortality does not uh, include these pregnancy associated deaths. They are also though disproportionate um, in, uh, amongst black women and uh, indigenous women. These are deaths from homicide, suicide, and drug overdoses. And um, NICHD has some uh, information about that. Um, they, have, they are wonderful, part of the NIH that has really done amazing work in maternal mortality. Um, and so that definition, that pregnancy-associated death is a maternal death either during pregnancy or in the postpartum year afterwards, that it is attributable to a condition that is unaffected by the pregnancy and occurs within one year of the pregnancy. So unaffected by the pregnancy um, and unrelated to the pregnancy. So something like when a person dies of a hemorrhage during childbirth, well, that's clearly because of the pregnancy. But these deaths, homicide, suicide, and drug overdose are considered not because of the pregnancy. Well, think about that for a minute. Think about that in terms of, uh, do we think that suicides in the postpartum year, they're oftentimes postpartum depression related. Um, is that not related to the pregnancy? Well, certainly it is. And so, you know, I really push back to this. Oftentimes the um, drug overdose deaths, um, the substance abuse is not caused by the pregnancy. Uh, the drug overdose is not caused by the pregnancy, but it's oftentimes related to the pregnancy in terms of her maybe trying us to stop using substances and then relapsing and using uh, a uh, substance that uh, causes an overdose. We know way too much about the fentanyl in our communities that's available. Well, pregnant women sometimes use it too. Um, and it may get, it, it may be uh, complicated by the pregnancy, if not that overdose death, if not caused by the pregnancy. We all know too that newborn babies are, it, it's tough um, in that uh, newborn stage in terms of, of being a mother and how we address this, especially if we don't have a lot of financial resources. Um, so there's, these things are very complicated and to totally dismiss them as being unrelated to or unaffected by pregnancy is very questionable. The homicides also, and this is of course, um, most of these homicides are intimate partner homicides. Um, we, I 
contributed to a review um, that was done of maternal mortality for indigenous women. And they looked at those pregnancy associated deaths. There's a lot of reviews, systematic reviews of um, maternal mortality that uh, do not include these um, pregnancy uh, uh, associated deaths. Um, and in that review, they only found eight studies that even considered uh, American Indian Native uh, American Indian <laughs> Native American women who were killed with a homicide when they're pregnancy. Only eight in a whole uh, twenty year uh, span. So we definitely need more research about this. We definitely need more documentation. And as I mentioned, that missing and murdered Indigenous women um, initiative is one way to try and get at that. Um, and the oftentimes, even those studies that do consider Native American women, they lump them into an other category. Um, and uh, so they, the very low percentage um, of, of these homicides, especially when we consider the disproportionately high rates of domestic violence amongst indigenous women that we do know about. Only nine studies um, investigated uh, indigenous Native American maternal deaths by suicide. Um, and that's, American Indian, Alaska Native. I'm sorry, I had a tongue twist there. And again, most of these studies are using, are lumping Native American women into other uh, racial ethnic groups. Um, and um, the one uh, study, the Palladino study did um, consider uh, American Indian Alaska Native women separately um, and found that this these suicides were disproportionate um, during pregnancy or in the postpartum period for indigenous women, but others um, either use that other category, other studies, or um, they uh, did not report uh, the risk for um, American Indian women, which again seems unusual and points out that there needs to be much more research because we know that suicide um, is generally is very high amongst indigenous women. It may be though that indigenous women do not kill themselves during pregnancy or in the postpartum as uh, differentiated from suicides during other times of life for indigenous women. Again, desperate need for more research in this area. And I know that uh, for us uh, at in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins, for you at Children's, you have a tiny proportion of your patients who are indigenous. But those who are really need um, particular attention and a culturally appropriate and informed uh, attention. Um, and the um, uh, other review that was done um, was one that I was a part of, and that's actually lead author on this one. Um, we did a deep dive into studies um, where there was homicide um, as well as suicide or uh, substance or drug overdoses during pregnancy or in the postpartum. Um, and um, when we look at other homicide studies, approximately 5% of women who are murdered by intimate partners are pregnant when they're murdered. So this is when we look at uh, intimate partner homicide overall versus uh, uh, pregnancy associated deaths. Um, and in that review though, when it was- 
uh, the woman was murdered, was uh, who died during pregnancy, um, eight to 25 percent of them uh, who died during pregnancy or in the postpartum die from homicide. Now, that's a wide variation, up to 25 percent. But no matter what, uh, a chunk, a, a non-trivial uh, proportion of women who die during pregnancy from all causes die from homicide. Among women who are murdered while they're pregnant, approximately half of them are murdered by, by partners. That's true when women are murdered overall in this country. Um, black women are definitely disproportionately affected, probably indigenous and immigrant women, but um, there were not enough studies that uh, considered uh, indigenous women to be able to see if they're disproportionately affected. And one of the consistent problems, and this is something, this is a policy thing, is that um, even though medical examiners, when they do an autopsy of a murdered woman, are always supposed to check off. There's a pregnancy checklist um, and checkbox. And it says, uh, you know, was this woman who has been killed and we're doing an autopsy, was she pregnant when she died? And uh, and then there's check back, yes, no, or uh, you know, there's no third option. She's either pregnant, she's not pregnant. And oftentimes those pregnancy checkbox are not filled out. Um, this is one of those, you know, policy things that somebody needs to be checking for that, uh, that pregnancy checkbox, if medical examiners aren't doing that, if they're not making a check, if they're not doing uh, an assessment for pregnancy, um, they should be getting fines. They should be getting reprimanded. This needs to stop if we're ever going to keep track. Um, and one of those is, uh, you know, especially it seems to be missing in homicide, suicides, and substance use disorders, um, deaths by overdose. Um, one of the things that's always amazing to me is that, uh, uh, again, that it's not done, and that some medical examiners are like, well, if she's not obviously pregnant when they do the autopsy, I can't tell. Um, and if, for instance, uh, and this is graphic, but if she was shot in the head, so I can't tell if she's pregnant. And that's what now I'm looking for cause of death. So I'm looking at the gunshot wounds and I'm like, excuse me, you could do a pregnancy test. Uh, you have urine available. It's not that hard. Um, and you know, so I just don't understand. And there, some somebody talked about the cost to me, a medical examiner of a pregnancy test. I'm like, excuse me, um, you know, they're not that expensive. So this is one of those um, things that if we don't track this, we'll never know how bad of a problem it is. Um, in national data, and this went through, uh, uh, was published in 2005, so um, it was a while ago, but um, even so, the uh, you can see there that homicide was the second leading cause of maternal mortality. This is considering maternal mortality from toxemia, from uh, hemorrhage, all the physical causes. This is ranking right in there. It was the second leading cause of maternal mortality after automobile accidents and firearms were the most common mechanism. And this was disproportion disproportionately present in black women again. Um, again, in a, a study that was done in Maryland and it was published in uh, 2010 and it was one of the best studies um, uh, 
actually, you know, I'm from Baltimore, so I can brag about Maryland. It's one of the best studies of maternal mortality um, that where the homicide and suicide was also considered. Um, and we found that homicide was the leading cause of maternal mortality in Maryland in that um, time period. And again, Black women, disproportionate firearms, the most common method. Uh, more than half of those pregnancy associated homicides were intimate partner homicides. Um, and uh, if you, if you uh, didn't look at the um, open cases, the ones that hadn't been solved, 65% were intimate partner homicide. Um, and half of that was during pregnancy and then the other half um, after the pregnancy ended. And all of the women who had a live birth in this period of time in Maryland had received prenatal care. The point being there that if we were asking routinely as we're supposed to as healthcare providers about intimate partner violence, we would have uh, been able hopefully to prevent some of those homicides. And sometimes in those cases, actually it was directly linked to a pregnancy. Uh, there was one case where um, this man uh, was married and um, he was having an affair with another woman. She got pregnant. He wanted her to have an abortion. She refused to have an abortion and he murdered her. Um, and one of the things that's uh, happening in Illinois is they actually passed a state law mandating that the state maternal mortality review panels review homicide. I know that in Maryland, our maternal mortality review panel, those are set up to review those uh, other causes of maternal mortality, not homicide, not suicide, not substance use um, substance uh, overdose. Um, but uh, in Maryland, we do review those uh, pregnancy-related uh, causes of death. In Illinois, they had to pass a law to mandate that the state maternal mortality review panel review homicide. And I meant to look, but I think one of the things uh, we be should be checking on is whether or not the DC Maternal Mortality Review Panel actually does review um, these deaths from homicide, suicide, and uh, overdoses. And what about Virginia? Um, does, does that Maternal Mortality Review Panel review these causes of death? Um, and so we also need to consider suicide. I think I've mentioned it a bit. Um, there was one study that, uh, estimated that suicides account for up to 20% of postpartum deaths. Um, the uh, One of the things we know is that suicide for the intimate partner violence is the strongest risk factor for suicide attempts globally. Um, and it's also been shown to be a strong risk factor for suicide for Black women in the United States. Um, it, again, the substance use disorder, the overdose deaths, fewest number of studies, um, and but clearly one of the issues we know uh, that overdose is, is a major cause of death um, in our country. All of these, the suicides, the substance use disorders are all significantly associated with intimate partner violence just like the homicides are. The National Violent Death Reporting System um, compiles all of the violent deaths from homicide and suicide um, in this country. Um, and uh, there were, in, in this study, there were only 17 states that were contributing to it. Now in 2023, all 50 states are contributing to the MVDRS. So this is a good source of, of 
data. However, you have to request it and then uh, do the coding, et cetera, in order to get a, a reasonable report. Um, we, um, I was on this study in 2011 and we're trying to replicate it now with all 50 states. But again, uh, homicides, 45.3% uh, of these uh, the causes of death from maternal mortality and pregnancy associated deaths. Um, the homicides were all intimate partner violence related uh, or 45% of them were. Um, the 42% uh, a partner or former partner murdered the pregnant woman, black women uh, were disproportionately um, affected Again, in this study, there was too few Native American women to actually compare. Suicides, 54% of those were intimate partner violence related. Um, and uh, so you can see graphically there, homicides, a greater proportion of causes of death in those 17 states, a greater number, um, and this is per 100,000 live births, then suicide, and suicide was number two, and hemorrhage was number three, eclampsia, number four, and um, embolisms, uh, uh, number five. And again, graphically, um, this is um, uh, Wallace's study, uh, really graphically showing that um, the homicides of pregnant women, um, slightly higher than the homicides of non-pregnant women, suicides of non-pregnant women higher than uh, pregnant women, but still uh, per 100,000, these are high numbers. Um, and this is another uh, comparison, um, homicide being greater than hemorrhage and placental disorders. Um, this was also uh, done with um, birth certificates and death certificates um, and finding higher rates of homicide than hemorrhage, hypertension, or sepsis. So I hope I've convinced you homicide is really important in terms of a uh, cause of maternal mortality. And what do we know about intimate partner violence around the time of pregnancy. Since intimate partner violence, those homicides are primarily by intimate partners. One of the things we know is that there are different patterns of abuse around the time of pregnancy. So way back in 2003, uh, these categories were uh, identified. There's abuse during pregnancy. There's intimate partner violence while the woman is pregnant. There's also abuse before pregnancy, the 12 months prior to the pregnancy. There's abuse around the time of pregnancy, which includes women abused before or during pregnancy and or both. Abuse during the year of pregnancy, that's the 12 month period during which a pregnancy occurred and abuse after pregnancy, abuse during the postpartum pregnant period. So with all this different terminology, it's no wonder that when you know, somebody says, how many women, what proportion of women are being abused um, during pregnancy? Well, it depends on what uh, part of the, the uh, pregnancy uh, period that you're counting. Um, and this was a, a study that was done using PRAMS. Now, PRAMS is that uh, if you've been pregnant lately, you get a, a, a survey after the pregnancy, a questionnaire, um, and people are asked to, uh, questions about the pregnancy. Um, and one of the questions is, were you abused by your partner during pregnancy? We always, always get a, a, a uh, lower uh, rate of abuse when you're looking backwards. Um, because the baby's born now and, you know, the, if there were difficulties during pregnancy, you've uh, forgotten them or, or minimized them oftentimes. Even so, we find that there is more 
abuse before pregnancy than during pregnancy. The, one of the patterns we see is that many times abusive partners um, want that baby. They uh, are trying to protect the baby during pregnancy. And so they don't actually hit her during pregnancy. This is another uh, graphic re representation showing the same kind of thing uh, where we have more abuse um, before for pregnancy than during pregnancy. And if we count the abuse both before and after pregnancy, then we have a higher rate. Um, this one is instructive because it, the other, um, are other people abusing or hitting a woman while she's pregnant or during, uh, before pregnancy or during. For adolescents, this is oftentimes parents. So sometimes we forget that part um, and we need to always, when we ask um, adolescents if they're being abused um, during pregnancy, when we talk to pregnant adolescents, we need to um, be sure to ask if anyone else is abusing her as well as a partner. We used to think, and some people still do, that pregnancy is a risk factor for abuse that there's more abuse during pregnancy than before. Actually, it's more often a protective period. As I said, many abusive partners um, are less abusive during pregnancy, at least less physically abusive um, during pregnancy, but it oftentimes starts up again afterwards. Um, and so, um, but what we have found from my research is that if he actually hits her during pregnancy, this is a risk factor for homicide. This is a more dangerous abuser. Um, and we need to be able to uh, identify those uh, high risk uh, cases where she's at risk for homicide. Um, one of the things, if the abuse lessens during pregnancy, gives her more hope that everything's gonna be okay when the baby is born. But as I mentioned, um, oftentimes it will start up again, the physical abuse, um, because of that highly stressful period after pregnancy. Um, this is a, a depiction, and this actually, this study was in the DC area, um, where we graphically put the overlap um, around physical, emotional, and sexual assault. This is not during pregnancy, but it we see the same kind of overlap uh, when abuse happens during pregnancy. That almost every woman who is physically abused is also psychologically abused. Uh, there's a great overlap between the two. Um, and Sexual assault forced sex during pregnancy happens the least often, but that you see that 18.7%, uh, 166 women were experiencing all three psychological, physical, and sexual assault. Um, at, and this was not during pregnancy, but that um, when they experience all three, there's much more health problems. Now, this is a very busy slide and I'm not gonna talk about all of it. However, one thing to remember, and you, you can uh, have access to these slides, I'm happy for you to do so, but to remember that there are a multitude of physical health effects from being abused. They are more problematic if this woman has experienced adverse childhood events, uh, that, that, that it makes these physical health effects from domestic violence even worse. Um, and that uh, part of these are around reproductive health, that we see more postpartum depression amongst women who are abused, more low birth weight and preterm uh, births, uh, more uh, small for gestational age infants. This means that some of these um, 
infants that are in our NICUs are um, in part there because of domestic violence. So it becomes really important that even as much as we want fathers in the NICU, that we want fathers in delivery, we always need to figure out a time to get her alone and ask her about the abuse, especially knowing that those patterns can change around the time of pregnancy. Um, we also have uh, a lot of uh, gynecological problems. We have a ton of chronic pain, and that can contribute to those substance use problems um, that women have. And that's a combination of, of injury um, and the of what happens in your brain if you're continually traumatized, um, that this um, it includes some effects on your uh, uh, HPA access. Um, axis, you know, A-X-I-S, things like fibromyalgia, et cetera, um, can be either caused or highly exacerbated by intimate partner violence. Old injuries that are never correctly treated. We see um, a lot of uh, traumatic brain injury in abused women. Um, Sleep problems is the thing that they most often complain of, and that's a combination of physical and mental health issues. We see more PTSD, more depression, um, more suicidality. Um, and you know, if you lay that on top of the childbirthing uh, woman, uh, that that's when you see that postpartum depression, et cetera. Um, those exposed to intimate partner violence, 50% more likely to experience fetal loss compared with women who are not abused. Um, this is some physical health problems from that PRAMS questionnaire. Women who reported intimate partner violence the year prior and or during pregnancy were at increased risk for high blood pressure or edema, vaginal bleeding, severe nausea, vomiting, or dehydration, uh, so that, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, that kind of, of um, pregnancy-associated nausea and vomiting that continues throughout the pregnancy, the morning sickness. Uh, urinary tract infections, hospital visits are increased, delivery preterm, low birth weight infants, as I mentioned, as well as small gestational age infants and infants requiring an intensive care unit, um, NICU treatment. Um, and again, this is a, a more recent study from PRAMS, uh, somewhere around 4% of women on the PRAMS thing reported physical intimate partner violence in the 12 months before and or during pregnancy. Fairly low percentage, we see higher percentages when women are actually individually asked by a prenatal care nurse or a nurse home visitor. Um, very much associated with being enrolled in WIC, with being unmarried, with being relatively young, with having an unintended pregnancy, smoking. Um, and we see that's somewhere between uh, twice as many women smoke during pregnancy. Very complex uh, part of uh, why they smoke, why they find it so difficult to quit when they're being abused. Um, it's, uh, you know, we can think about it in terms of the inhaling and the deep breathing, that that is a way of, of the body uh, managing stress is that part of what happens. Um, and the as, association with prenatal counseling on depression. So I alluded to screening, asking about intimate partner violence. There's really good evidence that screening increases disclosure. If we don't ask, women do not um, tell us about abuse. Um, and we do have interventions to reduce intimate partner violence. Um, it, screening does no harm, asking about it that's been tested and there's uh, no harm. Uh, but 
if we just ask and don't provide an intervention, that doesn't help. Um, I don't know why anybody thought it would, um, but we usually we need to do more than usual care. We need to do more than just giving somebody a phone number, a national domestic violence um, hotline number. The abuse assessment screen is one that's been uh, widely used uh, to screen for abuse. It has uh, five questions if she's pregnant. Um, and, um, you know, versus one question, people want to ask one question. They want to ask, are you safe at home? Um, as if people understand you're talking about people in the home versus smoke alarms or whatever. Um, so, you know, it, and it doesn't take that much longer to ask five questions. Uh, the first one, emotionally or physically abused uh, within the last year, have you been uh, hit, slap, kick, pushed or shoved? That's the lowest level of physical violence. It's really important to have that in there, not just asking about hitting. Um, and otherwise physically hurt, just takes a few more minutes to put that in there. Um, and then, uh, did it happen while you're pregnant? Um, and uh, as well as within the last year, that number two question. So it's important to see that covers before pregnancy. And then the forced sex is a separate question because she doesn't oftentimes think about that as um, part of the hit slap kicked. Um, and Number five, are you afraid of your partner? So whatever that partner does to you, um, I always think about the um, study that uh, was done in part in Texas. And some of the Hispanic women said yes to the, are you afraid? Um, and the nurses asked, how come you're afraid? And some of the women said, he throws knives at me. He would never hit me. Well, I'm pregnant, but he throws knives at me. And so that's the other thing um, that, you know, to give that kind of open-ended question that you, that you don't have to, um, so that you can capture women who are afraid of him for whatever reason. Remember, it doesn't really matter what you say. It matters how you say it. When I always say, what you say first, pause and say it slow. It's, this is not part of your, you know, you have this whole history form that you have to fill out. So say something like, because domestic violence happens to so many women and because it affects babies before they are born as well as after. Uh, that's why we're asking. And so we're going to ask everybody. Um, many times, especially for those uh, adolescents, you need to assure her you're not going to report her to CPS or immigrant women. You're not going to uh, report her to anybody and that you make eye contact rather than looking at the computer screen. And needless to say, you have to do it with privacy. You can't do it in front of women. So Futures Without Violence has a wonderful uh, website on um, how to ask, uh, what to do in terms of a, a warm referral when you ask. Um, and it's got all kinds of, of uh, information for providers. It's got uh, things you can, uh, signs, you could, um, posters you can put up or little um, cards you can give. You have to be careful in terms of giving her stuff to take home uh, because of uh, uh, abusive partners wanting to look at stuff. But if it's part of a bunch of stuff about prenatal care, that's okay. Um, and uh, if uh, women disclose, they're four times more likely to use some sort of intervention for domestic violence, two and a half times more likely to exit but we always have to remember she may not want to leave and we may need to be able to help her stay safely. Um, I'm going to just mention briefly, because I'm out of time, uh, the Dove intervention that's available. Uh, Phyllis Sharps, my colleague, um, developed it. It does decrease intimate partner violence. Um, our homicides are going up in this country. The danger assessment uh, is what I developed that helps us um, 
work with her to see how much risk she's at. There's a short form for clinicians. All of this is available on the Danger Assessment website. That's www.dangerassessment.com. Um, and there's also the My Plan app. Uh, my colleague, Nancy Glass, developed that. That's available in the app stores. It's really good for anyone that's abused or is in a relationship and they're not sure it's abusive. Uh, we do need a lot of things to do around midwifery care and doulas on culturally appropriate care. Um, but we also need to think about gun locks in terms of them going home with new infants. We know now that gun injury is the leading cause of death for children. Um, and we need to have some interventions for the fathers that uh, work early. Um, this is just a couple of quotes from people. A mention of new offender intervention programs that are uh, uh, include fathering, um, but also particularly ones that uh, can be done early uh, when abuse first starts um, so that uh, we don't have to wait for people to have to be arrested. So I see I got a bunch of folks, um, the questions in the chat, um, and I know it's time for you to go. Uh, so I thank you very much and um, we'll, uh, do uh, we'll do some answers um, in the chat. Looks like there's not too many, too many questions, but we'll provide um, answers um, uh, by email. So thank you very much for being here and uh, have a good rest of your afternoon. <music>